getting the most out of every ingredient. That's the mark of a maker. The KitchenAid Blender Collection. everyone to the final event of this year's food season um, and what a food season it's been it's been incredible um, I'm Melissa Thompson and I am um, guest co-director of this year's food season alongside uh, Polly Russell and, um, and Angela Clutton and um, oh, before I sorry, carry on thanks to our sponsors KitchenAid who have um, made the season possible um, I would say we're saving the best till last but then other people might get yeah, you can't well, say that. We don't need to say it, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, and as the finale, I'm really excited about this. So I think we've got two people who make the world of food a better place and um, people with um, extraordinary talent, but a lot of heart as well. Um, I'm going to introduce Itama, um, and then Itama's going to introduce Angela. Um, Itama, Itama is one half of Honey & Co, um, with his wife, Sarit, who is here. Um, and... Um, and also um, an author and <laughs> a restaurateur um, in the middle of, of, of doing up um, uh, the, the original Honey & Co after um, you moved out of the original site. So actually it's probably quite good that you're here because I imagine I'd always be quite bored, right? There isn't that much to do when you're, yeah, yeah, it was just when like, you're renovating a, a restaurant. Yeah. Um, and um, so Isma generally looks after the words and Sarit does the, um, the recipes and, and together it's a beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful relationship. Isma's writing is stunning. Um, and um, it has a column in the in the in the um, FT Weekend magazine as well, and it, and it stuns me how um, creative and imaginative the writing is um, week on week. It's really it's really impressive. Um, so Can thank you. Just you both. continue like this for the next hour and a half. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm very happy. No, that's me done now actually. Um, so everyone, just kick back and enjoy. Um, thank you to Isma. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. And um, I'm really looking forward to this. So uh, enjoy. Thank you. And thank you guys for coming. Yeah. So uh, Mel said that I'm going to introduce Angela, but I'm not going to do that. I don't think that Angela needs an introduction. Definitely not for me. We all know who Angela is. This is, this is why we're here. Uh, we just want to know a little bit more about Angela <laughs> and just chat. Chat with a her. conversation. Yeah. So I'm a, a very uh, famously very selfish conversationalist, so I'm just going to talk about the things that are interesting to me. <laughs> you will have your time in the last half hour. We're going to have a roving mic, and you will have your question. But we can keep it a little bit loose, so if you pick up on a thread and you want to pipe in, you can just shout. Yeah. We can... We, can, we don't mind. We can relax. It's, it's the last one of the season, guys. We yeah. can, we can, we can. Uh, hi, Angela. Hi, George. Welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> big, big round. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Angela, Angela. Very impressed you're all here, given how sunny it is outside. I thought you'd all bail for They're a glass of rosé. The They're hiding yeah. for the sun. Uh, you are the sun, Angela. Oh. Um, so good to be here to chat to you. Yeah. How are you? How was your... How was your plague? How was the pandemic? How was your last two years? Oh, gosh, God, yeah. Uh, fun, no, no, fun, was it fun? <laughs> no, fun. It's, it's, it sort of feels like it's happened and it feels like it happened a while ago. Does it feel like that for you? Like, even though you, there's sort of simmering bits still occurring, it does feel a long time ago. I feel like it's finished and we've now moved on. Yeah. But it's not finished by a long shot. There's so many repercussions from it. But pandemic, I was busy, actually. Um, we did we lots busy. of work, as, yeah. as, as, I, as I think most, a lot of people in hospitality did, because we were all shut our restaurants with fridges full of food. Yeah. And we all went to all the to various charities in London to, first of all, not waste anything. Then I, I remember we made all this, because there was stuff you could actually give away, and they would use it in food banks, or they would use it in, um, there's a great called City Harvest, fantastic charity in London, and they cook every night, and they take it to a lot of homeless charities. And shelters and but there was stuff that you know in a way it's like you know you've had potatoes peeled in the fridge you needed to use them 
And so I literally did a WhatsApp to like friends and family. And my cousin came back and he said, there's a lot of Irish pensioners in Southwark, Southwark in South London. They'd love it if you could bring some, because I said, look, we've got some stews we've cooked and everything. So all the guys made, used all these leftover vegetables. But of course, kids and chefs being what they are, they spiced everything up, like really spiced it up. So we take all this stew to the people, and this lovely guy Kevin's there, or Keith actually, and he comes back and he takes it, he's really happy, and we bring them more the next week, and then he goes, Angela, no, excuse my Irish accent, he goes, Angela, this is so kind of you, it's very, very kind, but I just got to say something. The oldies, they don't like the spice. Now, can you not with the spice? Now, if you could get some of that soda bread, the liquid gold, they love the soda bread. So, being me, being me, I went, oh, hey, Richard Corrigan. And he goes, it's like he had nothing to do, literally, because all the rest was closed. I said, do you fancy make a load of soda bread for all these lovely Irish pensioners? And so he did for literally, so the whole of the pandemic, once a week, we'd take very mild lamb stew or fish pie <laughs> or beef, and then we'd do a nice bit of soda bread as well. So we did lots of things like that. And then my friend Lulu, who's um, just started cooking literally for her mates who worked in the hospitals, and I saw that she was doing this, and I said, oh, what are you doing? I'll give you a hand. And, um, and it ended up evolving into us being in this massive outside kitchen space for a friend of mine, Greg, who runs Smart Hospitality. And other restaurants like Hawksmoor got involved, Robin Gill, um, Oaxaca. And every day we were cooking about a thousand meals a day. And they, they were going off to all the ICU units in lots of various hospitals in London. And it was great because then you had, and you did, and it wasn't like every day I was doing that. We had, we worked in groups because, you know, no one knew what COVID was. So we didn't cross over. So Monday you had a delivery group and a, and a chef group Tuesday and, you know, you all swapped ar around. So it was good because it focused you, I think. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, and I'll be honest, there was not, and you didn't work any night. You know, we worked lots of nights and it yeah. was lovely to go home and sit in the garden, you know. So, you know, we did some good things and, you know, and we relaxed a bit. So, um, and then waited for things to happen. Yeah. It was bizarre, really. I, I always think the pandemic was so good if it wasn't for the pandemic. Yes, it's, yes. Uh, if it wasn't for COVID, it would have been great. Yeah. But it's true. I was, you know, we were talking about it the other day, like bird song. And I said, oh, yes, oh, for the pandemic. Obviously, I don't want a pandemic, but I did like the idea. You had no planes, no cars. London, you could zip through in that a matter of minutes. It was yeah. silent. I mean, there were some lovely moments to it, but obviously it was a pandemic. Yeah. And, and it doesn't like belittle it or lighten, you know, because obviously it's a lot of people have suffered quite badly, you know. And then that sort of, um, you got an OBE for it. I mean, you, you're all very humble about it. And it's like, oh, yeah, we just rocked up and we cooked and then some <laughs> soda bread. But it was a huge operation. It, it yeah, was... it was. And then I got involved with Robin sort of later in the year. Robin Hudson, for those of you who don't know, he runs uh, the Pig Hotels, which are these lovely sort of homegrown hotels where they have a, what they call restaurants with rooms and they do all this kitchen garden. And, it, and it's great. And he was really put all the pressure on the government to try and get this Minister for Hospitality. I mean, every, loads of people signed up and we got, I think we got nearly 700,000 signatures. So it got petitioned in the House of, uh, the House of Commons, the House of Lords. Unfortunately, the government in, in their, I don't know, brilliance ignored it. Um, because, you know, our whole point was that, you know, we as a business, without uh, bleating on about it, a, a massive employee in the country and, you know, it's, and it's not us as restaurateurs or chefs or anything. You know, it's feeding people in hospitals, it's care homes, it's schools, it's, it's the people that build your restaurant furniture, it's the farmers. And, you know, with yeah. the EU as it is and Brexit, you know, it was like this was an opportunity to actually get... Because as Robin had, was in that weird position of having a minister that he would write letters to every day about what they were doing wrong in the pandemic because he had a hotel... And then because it was a restaurant, it was another portfolio. So he had two ministers over his and it just didn't make sense. And that's what we were trying to say. Should just be one stop. But we didn't well, get it. But we haven't given up yet. We'll 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 see. We'll see. I mean we haven't given up. We no. won't stop until you're a number ten. <laughs> Sorting the whole thing out. This is what these people are here for. This is what I'm here for. We're, we're doing it. It's happening. The movement. When's the next election? Mm. We we should we'll talk after. We'll talk, talk after. after. Yeah. So now it's all, you know. You're everything up and running. Yeah. As the restaurants are good and working, knocking yep. something. Yeah. And you're kind of like continuing your trajectory, which was quite amazing, actually. I was, you know, reading a little bit your your CV and how mm. you ended up 
yeah. restaurants. Tell, tell these guys a little bit about um, it, because it's a little bit roundabout. Yeah, it's very roundabout, I suppose. I mean, I was fortunate, um, and this is the, although half my friends um, always think um, I make this bit up. Um, my father, born in Ireland, came over from Ireland, grew up in Essex. My mother, born in Wales, of Italian parents, grew up in Wales, ended up moving up to Essex. And, um, and they met, so there was our union, a very Catholic, very um, Irish-Italian background. But because um, who this book is dedicated to, and we'll come on to that later, a, a lady called Patricia Llewellyn, who um, did a Great British Menu, when the first ever season came on, she was desperate for someone to represent Wales, and she's, she was Welsh, Pat. And she goes, go on, go on. I said, Pat, you do hear what I sound like. I do not sound Welsh. And my mother was born there of Italian parents. You know, it's very tenuous, my connection. She's, no, no, don't worry about it, don't worry. It'll be fine, it'll be fine. It's all TV, it's all TV. Is this why I always thought you were Welsh? Yeah, exactly, yeah. this is it. I mean, it's all Pat's fault. And I said, you know, so many people still go, oh, you're Welsh. I said, well, and I mean, it's no insult to the Welsh, in case anyone's here as Welsh. It's just, I, you know, I was born in Canterbury, you know, and of, you know, a, a, a lady who was born in, my mum was born in Wales and my dad was Irish. So, anyway, it's very um, odd. Um, but... Unfortunately, my father died when we were quite young. So my mother was left with three kids um, in Kent. And then we moved up to Essex, um, to a place called Upminster, where my mum still lives. Her family were already in Essex because her brother, uh, her father and his two brothers, who were all Italian, all owned fish and chip shops, one in Beckentree, one in Barking and one in Dagenham. So that's how I... I, I suppose that was my first thing into the food business. Yeah. I, on a Friday night, would go and do the chips at the fish and chip shop in Beckentree, and then I'd get the train home. And, and, I, start, and, I, and I, I worked quite hard. My brother was always very smart and still is. But I, as my mother always said, Michael has got the brains. And she's very good with her hands. So yeah. like, thanks, thanks Mum. Thanks for that. Uh, that's a delight um, to uh, yeah, yeah, delight to it. Well, actually, it was uh, illustrated last year. We were both um, at the FT Festival in um, Kenwood House. And my brother texts me. He lives in New York. And he goes, oh, you're at Kenwood House next week. I said, yeah. He goes, oh, yeah, I'm over there. I said, oh, great. I said... And I said, go on, what are you doing? And he was there talking literally after John Major in some macroeconomic, <laughs> you know, forum with four other speakers. And I was there doing a demo of pasta around the corner. <laughs> so I sort of said, you know. But you know what? <laughs> who's, who's, whose event do you want to be at? Let, let's just say it. Let you want to talk yeah. about, you know, I don't yeah. even know what that is. Uh, and you yeah. want to see Angela yeah. making pasta. Anyway, but I we... know where I am. <laughs> But so we, you're vindicated, we're I We're vindicated, feel. but yeah. we always laugh about that bit. Um, and so, uh, back to where... And So, you know, I grew up in... And all the, all the family on my mother's side, they all owned restaurants. They owned, well, not restaurants, they owned cafes and fish and chip shops or ice cream places and stuff like that. And it always seemed like a good way to... I thought, oh, this is how a family business or a yeah. business to make money. But um, went to the local convent school, uh, Sacred Heart of Mary Girls School, anyone who knows Essex well. And we went, and the, but everyone at that age, you know, because your parents always want you to do better. They were all going off to college yeah. or university. My brother went off to university, my sister went off to university. And I sort of said, you know, I'll, I'll do that for a bit. Even though my mum said, go to France or go to Cordon Bleu School if you want to learn to cook. I said, no, no, I'll go and do a history degree. I'll do that instead. So I went off to Cambridge Poly to do that. And then again, after that, sort of fell into working in pubs and bars, cooking. And because I was... At, I was quite good at it. I, I sort of progressed, not quickly, but, I, you know, I worked hard. I sort of got my head down and I enjoyed it. And I ended up working in a place called Midsummer House, which is now run by a chef called Daniel Clifford. And, and at the time was run by a guy called Hans Schweitzer. And this will tell your age how many people remember the Good Food Show with Jilly Cooper. Uh, there you go. And Chris Kelly. So Chris Kelly, he used to be one of the owners as well, you see. So... Um, this was probably before you were even in this country. There's this food yeah. programme called um, The Good Food Show. Anyway, and, um, and so he was one of the... And I worked there, and then Han said, well, look, you know, I've got a friend who works out... who's got a hotel in Barbados. Go and work out there for a bit. So it, it was all sort of very quick and, you know... And, but, it, but it seemed to just fall into place. But I think, I think if you like food... And, and I suppose my fortunate um, thing was I was, um, came from a family that did... They, you know, they were war children, my parents. You know, they both were born in the, the war years. 
My grandfather was interned in the Isle of Wight because he was an Italian and, you know, we know Italy was swapping left, right and centre during the Second World War. So he got sent off. My grandmother had three children plus her nephews, all and a fish and chip shop in Wales, you know, barely speaking the language. So, you know, they came out of that those years really having such respect for food and no wastage. And, yeah. and, um, and a work ethic. Exactly, yeah, and a work ethic. And a friend of mine, she's here today, um, Laura, she'll know that I was always... Uh, staying a lot of my grandmas, I was always the eldest granddaughter, so I always used to go and have to do her shopping. And if things weren't right, she would literally send me back to the veg shop. You know, it was humiliating when you're 10 or 12. But it's such a lesson. It's such mean, a lesson. And it made me broke because yeah. I was too embarrassed to go back. So I'd go and buy other stuff out of pocket money. You Are you know? serious? Yeah, because you, how do you go back and go, oh, my grandmother thinks your veg is rubbish. Can you, you know? But it did show me how to buy properly, you know. And... And I'll always remember my mum, we went up to an Italian deli, because all the Italian delis at the time were up in uh, 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 Clerkenwell, you know, the b a big Italian community. And she went up, my brother, my mum, if you meet her, she, know, she doesn't look Italian. And, and she went in and she said, can I have a fresh bit of Parmesan, please? And what she meant was a fresh cut piece. Um, from the big wheel, and the, and the, he sort of was a bit patronised. He said, "Oh, madam, madam, you know it can't be fresh. It's two years old." And my mother, she goes, and then she turned in Italian and she said, "Ma la so, la so sono due anni." You know, well, and, she, and he went, "Oh my God!" You know, but she was absolutely right. She was basically, saying, "I want a fresh cut, and I don't want to be paying for the rind." And that was her point, you know. And so I sort of think it does, you know, it does because, yeah. you know. I think you'll agree exactly as me, it's all that it's we're we're only as good as the produce we yeah, buy. Yeah, good cooking. You know, is, is don't mess shopping. around with it. Yeah, yeah. and then you, you, your job's easy, then, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that was a long chat, wasn't it? No, but, but yeah. I'm saying you, you 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 kind of like gloss over it, but actually, I'm sure, Midsummer House, and then later in, in with the Gordon Ramsay. Yeah, you sorry, were, I didn't even get. It's not. Yeah. You know, it's not like a job. Yeah. And especially those kitchens yeah. are hard kitchens. Yeah. You know, not everyone mm. can do them. Yeah. You know, the, the long, long days, the grueling services. Yeah. So when you say, you know, hard worker, it yeah. really does mean yeah. a very hard worker. Yeah. Like, I'd, I'd definitely do the aubergine again. I went down three dress sizes. Yeah. And it's like, I was like that by the end of it. I was like, the result of that. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but then, you yeah. know, there's... There's the... Downsides the downside. as well, yeah, of course. Yeah, is, yeah. yeah. No, listen, I went into that. Um, you know, coming up from Cambridge, where we at Midsummer House was, we would finish at ten o'clock at night. You'd cycle home. It was all very easy. You had a couple of hours off in the afternoon. It was very nice. And you know, and I sort of I went with. Well, you say a couple of hours off in the afternoon after working, you know, five or six days full days. No, but that's the thing. Yeah, but um, in in Midsummer House, it wasn't. Uh, it was, it was quite, you know, we'd start about nine o'clock, we'd finish about three in the afternoon, we'd go home till about five, because Cambridge is small, you would yeah. go home, and you'd come back for six o'clock service, finish around ten, and, you know, you'd have a couple of days off and a split shift. So it was quite easy, it was a nice way that's, to that's get into it. That's your idea of an easy job. True, yeah. but then when I went to work with Gordon, I was like, went in quite blinkered and didn't even think to ask about the hours, and I started at eight o'clock the first day, and then... Marcus that night said, you know, we start at seven. I went, oh, right, okay, excellent. You know, and then I was just like in this trance. But, we, you know, we did work incredibly hard. Um, and looking back, there's times I think, what am I doing this for? Um, but I wanted to stick it out for me for a year and I was quite stubborn and I did do it. And then after a year, I said, that is it. I can't do it anymore, Gordon. I can't physically do these hours. It's draining me. But, in, you know, not you'd earn your stripes, but, you know, I knew that Gordon liked me and I knew that then I was going to follow him in what he did and go with to restaurants with him and ended up working for him in lots of restaurants for the next, you know, a long, long time, for um, 17 years. And, I, I, you know, there's a lot of negative things you can say about Gordon, but for me, it, I, I do come out and think it was a positive experience. I, you know, I love Gordon to death and I, I don't think I'd be here today without him. You know, he invested in someone who had very little experience and he took a punt on it. Um, and, and he's always looked after, you know, and even now to this day, he'll sort of, you know, everything all right, need anything, you know, it, you know, he's a good, I know there's people he's fallen out with, but, you know, for me, he employed me and I've always, you know, had a phenomenal loyalty to him. That's amazing. Yeah, because I mean, he used to call me Dizzy Lizzie when I used to do everything wrong. <laughs> and there was many a day I did that, trust me. <laughs> there was a brilliant one when I, 
these we have what we call walk-in fridges and they're tiny i mean they're probably like literally this like this you know and, and in london space is pre premium premium so you of course the smaller they are and i went in one day and I, and these souffle molds were on this tray just literally jutting out and i bent down to get something knock them all out and you just heard this crash and then you heard gordon effing and blind again <laughs> What's Dizzy done now? What the fuck? And I you know, pop my little head. Hi, Gordon. Oh, just just one or two moulds. Fine, it's fine. You know, and then I literally go into the pastry. Damien and the whole fucking drive. You know, we're running up to the kitchen shop up the road. You know, literally, he's like, you've broken every single one. I'm like, oh my god. You know, so there were all these little things, but you had this sort of camaraderie of you just as long as you didn't tell Gordon, we'd get away with it. You know. <laughs> But you, you came out from those kitchens, yeah. you know, it was kind of like early 2000s, something like yeah, that. Yeah, 2000 went and did the Connell, yeah, and then yeah. late 2000 did uh, Murano. Murano. Yeah. And then you, you, it's kind of like, it's a big shadow, yeah. Gordon Ramsay, but you sort of managed to carve out your own sort of public yeah. identity and, you yeah. know, of course, your business. Mm. Was that, you know, was it intentional that you say, okay, now I'm going to focus on me put me forward or were you just like doing your thing and it happened or? um i think um i think it got to a stage where gordon's business you know where there was a generation of us myself marcus waring jason atherton mark Askey, we'd all worked together we'd all come up through the ranks we'd all were running hotels or restaurants for good and, I, and it suddenly felt natural that actually it's time for you to do your own thing and i think you sort of wake up and think well actually you know what i'm going to make the money for myself and not someone yeah. else and i had a lot of people who were more th that would say you know if you ever go out on your own you know give us a call and and you know and i was fortunate i had two or three people who did that enough for me to buy gordon out of murano and it was never you know uh, an issue that um he wouldn't sell to me even though people thought he might not because it hadn't happened with marcus and etc cetera, etc cetera. But uh, like I said, you know, we always got on very well. And I, you know, and he just said to me, why didn't you say that from the beginning? You know, why wait two years, you know, two years of us working together at Murano. So it felt, and, I, and also I felt confident having open Murano still under, I suppose, the Gordon Ramsay banner and with the security that if anything went wrong, because when you own your own business, that that's transformational. Yeah. Because then as you, I don't need to tell you, uh, you're the one who's paying the bills, paying the VAT, paying the gas, and more importantly, you're paying however many staff you have. And that sort of wake up at night thinking, Christ, you have to fill that restaurant lunch and dinner. Because, you know, everyone thinks the margins in restaurants are sky high. Uh, it's not, you know, and one You've bad... You've heard it here first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one bad week or one yeah. bad month can just throw you. So One you know, bad two years. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> one yeah. bad pandemic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's making sure every single thing is, you know, and, um, and so, you know, and that's continual. You know, you can never sit in there go, oh, yeah, tick, that's works. Because then you have a day where you're outside seating... It's raining and then, you you know, anyway, there's lots of reasons things yeah. don't work. So, so it was a good training ground. And then I felt, actually, I can do this. And I've, I've got a great business partner, Chris, who I've worked with for years. And we're very good. We manage well together. You know, he's very finance driven. He, he knows what how to make the money, in a sense. I can be more visionary and it, we, we work well together. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, and the point is, like, like any relationship, you back down when you know your argument's not, you know, he'll yeah. sometimes win me, you know, beat me, and I'll go, no, I don't agree, and vice versa. He'll say, well, actually, I think this, but if that's what you want to do, let's do it, you know. So you need, and I think the key to making it work is surround yourself with people that do their job better than you do it. Yeah. You know, I've, I'm never going to be the first. I mean, Garth, who, who is the finance director, is brilliant because he knows when we have these meetings, I zone out and I'm probably sitting there on the BBC website checking the Arsenal score or something. And he'll literally be talking to me and then he'll, he'll do what my brother does and go, Angela, did you understand? <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I'm 54 and I should really know all this. And I go, uh, essentially, Garth, do I lose the house? He goes, no. I said, then we're cool, as long yeah. as I don't lose the house. <laughs> and, but, you know, and I'm being flippant about it and obviously I know more, but ultimately, that's where it comes to, you know, you've yeah. put things against loans and you know what you have to do. So, I, you know, I, he, he really will put it in black and white to me. So I absolutely know. Sure. And, and, and that's what I need. And I'm not patronised at all by that because I know it's not my interest or my forte. So yeah. I need someone to 
literally put it in my face to say, this is what you need to understand. Yeah, and it gives you the freedom to yeah. do what you do. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. So I think for a lot of us here, we, we, you know, we do have this kind of image or perception of you. as. I'm very red, am I very red? No, you're good, man. Ooh. That age, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we, we kind of like, you are a household name. You are sort of, uh, you know, flying the flag maybe for this industry. Uh, I don't know if you like it or not, but for women in this industry, yeah. for leadership in this industry, and, you know, uh, all of that. You're famous for Italian food. Nonna Clorinda, we didn't talk about it, but she's a household name. And then this book. <laughs> Nonna Clorinda, would she? <laughs> yeah, she's very private, my grandmother. But anyway, that's fine. Sorry, Nonna. But anyway. Yeah, well, you know. Yeah. This is payback for yeah. sending you back yeah, to the exactly, grocery. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, making me Miss Grange Hill and <laughs> to make pasta. But this this book just came out and kind of um, I wouldn't say a, a different Angela, but something new about you that I I've never seen before, yeah. and, and I quite. Love this. <laughs> so tell, tell us a little bit about this book, how it came out. and Very fortunate to, um, I've spoken about my brother, uh, very fortunate to live in East London. I own a house with my brother. He lives in New York, so um, I get the benefit of that. And, and we've lived there now 20 years, I think, coming on for 20 years. And it's a great area. It's a great community. Sandra, who's at the Golden Heart, is the heart of the community. She's our local landlady. Um, and and because you know it's a great house and we're we're very fortunate we have a little garden it's not massive you know but it's big enough that we can put a table out there and people can eat and we can have a, a nice uh, party or whatever and we like and I like cooking at home even though people say it's a busman's holiday it doesn't bother me because I find it much more relaxing than actually cooking at work because there's no paying customers yeah. it's in your time you can. Have, have the radio on the music, you cook what you want to cook, you know, so... I love you write in the book that you prefer having people over because then you could just go upstairs. Oh, yeah, Instead then of that's it. slipping all the way across town, you're just like, <laughs> OK, dishwasher that, on, going to That bed. is another yeah. reason, you know, I, I love the, the fact you can just go upstairs, and, yeah. well, and my husband passes out far more times than I do, but, <laughs> um, but you literally can go upstairs and it's done, you know, so... So that's great, and and you know, and we've got, and we've become friends with neighbours, or you know, or neighbours have become friends. And Pat, who was, I suppose, the inspiration in lots of ways. She, I spoke about her before, Patricia Llewellyn, Pat Llewellyn. She was did ran Optimum TV, and they did the Two Fat Ladies. She discovered she's the voice in the first Naked Chef. Discovered Jamie Oliver, you know, did the F word with Gordon, Kitchen Nightmares, you know, she, she, Great British Menu, you know, really sort of put, TV, made yeah. food, you know, put food on TV. And she moved around the corner from me uh, about, uh, well, probably now 10 years ago. And because Pat and I always got on really well, and other neighbours, I'd say, oh, come over for supper. And we were very casual about it. And we still are, you know, if people come over, not everything matches, glasses don't match. There might be the odd chip on the plate. You might be waiting a bit longer for stuff. But we all, you always do have a good time, and we always make sure you do. So, And Pat says you should write this down. You should sort of make a book about that it's easy to entertain. Not easy, but easier than most people think it is. And that's how we, it came about. And so uh, my, uh, every recipe in that book is something that we have done at home. Some, di some recipes have been based about parties we've had, whether it's a Burns night party, which we do every year. I mean, this year, everyone worries about messing things up. You know, I, I said to Neil, oh, we'll make the trifle. I mean, he still hasn't forgiven me for making him make it at three in the afternoon. And then he let the custard down. I don't know why he did this with creme fraiche, so it all went sloppy and didn't set. And then I said, we're not serving it. I mean, Faye was upstairs. Faye, Faye Mashler, the critic, was upstairs. And I just said, you're all having cheese and biscuits, and just threw a load of cheese and biscuits. <laughs> and Ewan was saying to me, well, was it no like trifle? Tri I said, no, no trifle. There was no, no trifle. No, no. And, you know, and it's, you know, we screw things up as much as anyone, yeah. you know. Are you not scared of cheats? No, I'm not. Kitchen no. cheats. No. I mean, I will say there is a recipe here for haggis that starts with... Uh, the list of ingredients is a pluck of... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's James Ferguson. Which is probably, I think, kind of like... Too much, The yeah. most challenging yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. But every book should have one of these recipes. I think that, so, yeah. You know, it's yeah. Uh, but also cheats gazpacho. Discuss. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, um, again, we have lots of family uh, over. And uh, my brother, my sister, my mum were over with some various friends one night. 
And I think even my uncle and aunt, you know, we are close, we do eat at home a lot. And I, I, in my normal run, chaotic life, I left this at the last minute to um, organise dinner. So I ran to a local supermarket, I think it was Waitrose, and bought all the various pistachios. So whether it was Covent Garden, Fancy, Waitrose, Brand, and threw them all together. Added olive oil, tomatoes, and basil, stuck it in a bowl in the fridge. Pimp it up, yeah. Pimp it up, pimped it up. Served it, everyone's oh, delicious. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh, thank you. I said, yeah, he says, you've just got to marinate. The secret is marinating 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you pay him out with all this spiel. And then a friend of mine, Liz, um, who's, who comes around a lot, um, went down. Because, as I said, we, we, we eat on sort of the ground floor, but the kitchen's in the basement. And everyone always helps clear. So and then she opens the dishwasher and she just stands there. Says, what's worse now? You've blatantly lied, <laughs> lied to your family, your mother, your brother and sister, immediate family and friends. Or that you're so sad you keep plastic containers and wash them in your dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, and every time Liz comes around, she literally goes, just, just check it. <laughs> <laughs> Tesco finest in the Tesco, bin. Tesco, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're not keeping this? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, but yeah. you have to keep the plastic container. Of course you do. You've got yeah. to, we can't recycle, you see. Rinda, recycle. Well, not she went off, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Got to steal all those sort of things, yeah. Uh, but this is kind of like the, the spirit and the heart of this book. Mm. It's full of these little... Beautiful little nuggets, and you know, I, I just couldn't get enough of it. But I think that the spirit of the book starts even in the first page. This is the author's page, and then it's with lots of help from Neil, friends, neighbors. It's a mm. joint yeah. effort, yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. And it's there's something very beautiful about it and very yeah. real as well because this is how. Life yeah, is, isn't it? No, I think so. I mean, we've got great neighbours next door. The, you know, she, Kate makes the most amazing jam. I mean, she really does. And Some so, people yeah, have a real... She's got a real knack. And, you know, and I literally am waiting now for her, the apricot jam to come through. And she's really great. And, you know, and then... And, and I think lockdown, I think everyone probably had a bit of that, or hopefully, is that you had things. Like, we would make stuff. You see, everyone was, you know, a bit, not bored, but was making stuff at home. And I would text going... I've got a bit of extra lemon meringue pie. And Kate would go, yes! And I'd go, OK. But you didn't meet anyone. you just put it outside the door and then ring the bell and you'd go inside your house, you know, because no one was seeing anyone. So we did a lot of that, um, of sort of cooking things for neighbours and helping them. And, th and they would cook, like, Nick's curry in there. Nick is a mate of mine, makes brilliant curry. And Kate would come round, his wife, in lockdown and bring the curry. And I said, oh, and then I texted him. Yeah, I said, do you mind if I put that in the book, you know, so... He's very, he said to the other day, he goes, where's that, where's my, my recipe coming out, Ange? I said, it'll be out next week, Nick. No, but this is w one of the, the, the most beautiful things about this book. There's the, you know, the, the chapters, starter soups, meat, fish, pasta, rice, vegetable. And then there's a chapter of neighbours. It's just like yeah. the random dishes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sort of ended up, and I find it so... Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's something so beautiful about it. Yeah, it's very you know? warm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and the, the beautiful photography as well, that's yeah. all in... Oh, yeah, Jonathan, yeah. brilliant, yeah, no. Um, it does, the, the sense of, of community and mm. neighbourliness really comes through, and I think, you know, for... I was kind of, like, jealous, because I, yeah. I don't have that. I don't have a, a you know, a yeah. local pub and things like that. I do, yeah. actually. I'm sure you do. Right? I mean, I'm not a good neighbour myself. This is what I learned about Right, myself. OK, yeah. right. Israelis don't make good neighbours. Do you steal their you newspapers? You heard it here first. Sorry? You steal their newspapers? I'm very envious. I'm envious of my neighbour's garden. OK, So right, I'm always, yeah. like, I'm, I always have a chip on my shoulder. OK, all right. So you just grunt at them in the morning? I kind of, like, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You. Yeah. 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 It's on me. I take it. Yeah. But this is, is something that, that is so beautiful and is so mm. to be celebrated in our life. Yeah. Again, there's, you know, the, the chapter about the sweet part, the street party. Yeah. Which I'm guessing you're going to do another one. We are. Weekend. I was placing my bagel order this afternoon as Ooh, we classy. speak. Yeah, classy. Very nice. nice little, yeah, little bagel, yeah. Well, when, yeah, so yeah, street party this next week. I think most people will be having some sort of celebration. One would hope. Wasn't there like a jubilee like five minutes ago? I, I don't get the, the whole thing. Twelfth. Uh, yeah. No, 2012. Um, she is 96, you know. She's quite a few birthdays and, you know, pushing I think, on. yeah, she's pushing on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, 
Your husband, Neil. Yes. He's a chef as well. Yeah. I'm interested to hear. <laughs> how does that work out? And how does that fit out? Uh, a very... A very An amazing chef, yeah, actually. He's One brilliant. of the best chefs I th- in the country. I think, Neil's a, I think Neil's a far better chef than me. Um, he's, he's got a really natural talent about it. Um, he, uh, he's great, he, but he's messy, and he's learnt that from Phil Howard. I, I, Phil Howard Phil, is messy? Oh, God. Do you know, do you, yeah. Does everyone know who Phil Howard is? Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a mental image of yeah. him? Yeah. No. I think he just, I can't imagine him even walking. He just like wafts in space. I mean, who, I mean, it's Neil that learned, well, Neil, when Neil and I worked together at the Connell, he was definitely tidier. Then he went off to France. There's no way in France he would have been untidy. Then he went to the square and I said, what the hell has happened to you? And he said, he goes, oh, it's Phil. Phil can be a bit like that. Like Phil will start something and then wander off and leave it. And then someone's clearing that up. I said, oh, no. They start. So, but the thing is, Neil will do that at home. And it's, you know, when you've got a big kitchen, uh, you can get away with it slightly. But it's still very annoying. But at home, it's really annoying. So um, we tend to try and... So Neil will cook and I'll sort of clean around. And then I will cook. We don't tend to cook together because we have trifle gate if we do. Because <laughs> I get really like... Just, you know, he will take his time. You know, he really... You know, I will be like, come on, people are coming. Get a move on, for, you know, and just be swearing. And he will like, don't rush, but don't. And when he does this thing, babe, babe, don't, don't, don't shout at me. And I and I hate it when he calls me babe because he does it to wind me up. And so we end up having an argument. So it's far better that I let him cook, and then I stay out of the way, and then I come and clean, and we cook separately. What about you two? Do you do? Yeah, you know, I suppose you probably do. You work together. I so. mean, we don't work in the same kitchen. Oh right. Never. No. Wow. We, we stopped doing that. Oh, yeah, so you know, uh, feel, feel the pain, yeah, yeah. But I'm like you, I think Sarita is an amazing, yeah. amazing cook. She is. Yeah, and it's like every time me, like I, I would always sort of coax her yeah. to the kitchen. She's very clean. Yes. Like surgical yeah. clean. Yeah. And then it's like the food that she comes up with, it's, yeah. it's unbelievable. I'm like, I don't, I don't care, I don't mind it. I, I don't give a fuck. I'm going to be as fat as I want to be. I'm so happy. <laughs> Because uh, you like if you had someone cooking like this at home, you'd yeah, be as yeah, fat yeah, as me, yeah. and you'd you'd embrace it. <laughs> um, but the, the I just want to talk about Neil's food, the, that garlic toast. Yeah, that's going to be on everyone's table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a, that is a Hopkinson inspired recipe, which I think we say Simon Hopkinson, who's, who's wrote, written many cookbooks, was one of the best one. Roast He's chicken amazing, yeah. is brilliant, and it's. Um, And, you know, and I think it's either fr- similar to the one he's done or Neil's have done. But Neil does it at the French house where he has a whole piece of sourdough, puts his lovely goat's curd on it, and then he confies whole bulbs of garlic. And then, you know, the idea is it sits on there and you just squeeze it all over that toast. And, and my poor nephew, Finn, we were eating there one night and my, Neil did this. And Finn wasn't quite sure what to do with the garlic. You know, he was only this 16-year-old kid and stuff. And... Uh, And, and it was sort of, Neil came down, he hadn't right eaten it. He goes, and, you know, and I'd eaten all the bread and stuff. And, you know, and Neil was like, right, doing another one. Finn, I'm going to show you how to eat garlic. And <laughs> the And after, it, loved it, of course. But, you know, but I remember when we've put sometimes, you know, we've done, well, Neil's done at the French has whole artichokes. Yeah. And a friend of mine, who's probably one of the most travelled people ever, he goes, Angela, I've never had that. You know, some of the simplest things. Yeah, yeah. And was flawed by how to eat it, you know. So I think sometimes, you know, there's got the skill is also making sure everyone doesn't feel patronized or they've got to feel, you know, relaxed about eating food. So, but Neil's great cook. He's great, messy but great. Yeah. Well, you know. Yeah. There's a price to price to pay. Is that what you're telling me? Does he sort of coax you into the kitchen? I'll always make the pasta dishes. Like I made, we had some. I did, even though I said, it was Friday, it was, I think you probably have these moments when you've had a long week, and it was last Saturday, and we had some, and I'd keep everything in the freezer, and I knew I had these old trimming bits of red mullet in the freezer, enough to do a pasta for two, and I just did this, like, garlic, garlic chilli in a pan, tomatoes, fresh tomatoes, cook them down soft, and then literally a bit of white wine, put the mullet on top of it and let it cook, and I did it with spaghetti, and it was delicious, I have to say. And even I was, I said, I ate it and I said, bloody hell, that's good, isn't it, Neil? Uh. I said, and he kept saying to me, have you put lobster in it? I said, well, why do you keep saying this? I haven't put lobster. He goes, it's very good. I said, you know what? Those bloody chefs, sod it. I'm going to just open a little pasta restaurant. 
I'm going to cook and I won't have to employ anyone. Yes, that's what I did. Because <laughs> I'd had one of those weeks where yeah, yeah, yeah. everyone was driving me nuts. So I yeah. thought, that's it. Done. You have the, the hat yeah. on the beach fantasy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We've all had that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're dreaming of it now, aren't you? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm dreaming of this pasta. Yeah. I'm dreaming of your hat on the beach. That's the problem. You're going to open a yeah. hat on the beach in five minutes. It's going to be madhouse like your life yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we'll yeah. all come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone but if it's here. one bowl of pasta every five minutes, at least I'll only be able to do so much. I yeah. mean, anyway, yeah. this is, yeah. Uh, if, if this is your retirement plan, yeah. I'm, I'm, You're coming. I'm for it. it. I'm definitely for it. I want to circle back a little bit to that dinner that's mentioned in this book yeah. with uh, Phil Howard and Bruce Poole, yeah. which I'd be cacking myself. Yeah. I'm not Angela Hartnett, for sure, yeah. but it's, you, you, you don't get phased. Well, I did, I did say to Neil, I said, we've got to... I said, Neil, because we had Bruce, who's, who's there, Phil, both really great chef. Robin was there, who runs uh, the pigs as well. And I think Chris was there, yeah. So there was quite a big, you know... All in. I said, Neil, you know. I can't said, even imagine Phil Howard eating. Oh, no, like, he loves food. Phil. Really? Yeah, I know he, he really. lives off, like, solar energy and caviar. No, no, he really... But Phil, Phil's thing has got to be delicious, all about delicious food. So we were smart. We did we did a good menu. So we started with a pasta dish, and I have this little annalini and brodo that I've told you about before, so a little pasta dish in broth. And then we did this turbot, you know, and where we are blessed as chefs and restaurateurs and stuff is we have a supply chain that yeah. we can pull on. So we were able to call the fish suppliers and get it exactly as we wanted. So Neil presented this big turbot because I said to him, I said, we can't screw up now, Neil. I said, <laughs> you know, I said it can't be our normal carnage that, you know, it doesn't, you know, with the neighbours and family we can get away. I said, you know, I said, I'm not saying we have to be all ridiculously over the top I said but at least let's make sure we do this right and we don't overcook the fish or anything and then Neil made and that's in that recipe as well he made this great uh, dessert called a gatto basque which again is I mean I, I sort of agree there's just 60 recipes in the world they just have reinventions and it's a, a recipe that he learned from a chef called um, William Curley who's an amazing pastry chef who worked for Pierre Kaufman and it's a very much a sort of southern French traditional in a pastry case with a sort of vanilla cream and prunes. I mean, you know, what and baked all together. So things like that, I think, are just good dishes. So I mean, you do have to soak the prunes for a month. You do have to, yeah, like in rum. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, but the the rest of it is quite straightforward. The rest of it's easy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's. I'm I'm sure I'm not the only one. No. Drooling, just thinking about <laughs> this meal. Um. Another thing that I loved, another little anecdote that I love is about the the aubergine dish. Where's my, mm. where my notes? Discuss. Discuss yeah. the aubergine dish. Pat and Ben's aubergine dish. So, as I said, Pat in the book, Pat inspired the book, and Pat was moving to the neighbourhood with Ben, and they had a mutual friend. Basil is in the book as well. He's got a recipe. Um, and, and I said to Pat, even though she knew a few people, I said, why don't we have a party for you, welcome you to the neighbourhood, we'll invite loads of people, you and Ben come and blah, blah, blah. And she goes, oh, fantastic, darling, lovely, lovely. And um, and we said, I said, do about two in the afternoon on a Sunday. And uh, she goes, well, I'll sort out all the booze. And I said, right, we'll sort out the food, no problem. I was coming back from Limewood Hotel, which is where I sometimes, I've got a consultancy in the New Forest. And I was driving back from London and I probably, yeah, and I thought, oh, OK, I'll get to London, I'll buy stuff as I get into London and we'll all be sweet. And Pat turns up at the house at 12 and Salvatore, who's uh, a lodger that will never leave, is living <laughs> with us and, he, and, and he's Italian. Don't blame him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, Pat came in thinking that she'd see plates and dishes already and I wasn't anywhere to be seen, Neil wasn't anywhere to be seen and she said... Darling, it's every, you know, Pat and Neil was having talk, calm, they'll be fine, don't worry, they know what they're doing. But anyway, when she came back at three o'clock, we had. But, you know, I came in and I pushed, you know, I ran around and I made sure everything was ready and Neil lit a barbecue and did this one aubergine dish, which I think was an Yotam inspired dish, you know, where it was grilled with yogurt and mint. And it was delicious. And like I said, he has these little finishing touches. I, meanwhile, had done about six salads. I'd roasted meat. I'd done chickens. I'd done a made of strawberry. I'd laid the table, blah, blah, blah. You know. So everyone's there. We're all having a great time. And everyone's coming up and going, thank you, delicious. Love those aubergines. <laughs> and then someone else, I oh, really love it. Oh, those aubergines. And I was like, and then Ben, Pat's husband, came up. 
And he, and then of course, you know, by then the joke was going through that he goes, Angela, I love those cool shirts. I said, oh, fuck off, Ben. <laughs> I was like, I know you like the bloody aubergines better than anything else. And he's going, no, but what did you think? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I don't know what he <laughs> And even now, I was like, Neil, we've got to put this in the book. He goes, well, I don't really remember. I said, well, Try and remember. You, you know, work it. Yeah, work it. Make you need it those aubergines. Anyway. Yeah, it's really annoying. It's always the one yeah, thing. Yeah, the one they, thing, yeah, exactly. That they hold on to us. Like, Honestly, oh, I said, I've done nothing else, of course, yeah. At least it was yeah. not the gazpacho. Mm. <laughs> that would have been... I should have done my gazpacho trick, and then that would yeah. have been it, beating the aubergines. That would have been really yeah. sort of rubbing it in. Yeah. Um, I mean... We can go on and on and on and just sort of pick all of the anecdotes and dishes from this book. But you're going to, I mean, you are going to buy it anyway. But for the rest of it, this is just kind of like a taster because this book is like brimful of these beautiful, delicious things and beautiful, delicious stories. But I just want to, before I pass it on to you guys, I'm going to put Angela on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to read a little bit from the... It's a great laugh. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was stewing on it. I was fermenting on it. Um, I'm going to read from the intro to this book. I'm an informal host, and I will often text people on the day to see if they want to come around for something to eat. Over the course of the photo shoot for this book, I'd often text neighbours to find out who was free and then invite them over to eat all the food we just cooked. I've done the same when clearing out the freezer. So what I'm going to ask you to do now, Angela, we're all here. We want to be on your contact. <laughs> we want to be the people that you text when you clear out the freezer, when you shoot the next book. Yeah, we yeah. want to be on the list. Phone yeah. out. Phone pass out. it around. Pass it around. If yeah. you want to join yeah. this group, contact, yeah. you can add your contact. Angela will text you. The largest WhatsApp group there is. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Who is around? I think you'll be... Yeah, you'll be doing no, no, a we lot do. of catering. We do. Well, Salvatore is the best because I'll literally there'll be you know you do a shoot for a day, you know. Yeah. You you can do and Jonathan's very quick, so we can end up doing like eight recipes, and then you're working the next day. And I hate food waste, so I will pack stuff up. And if Salvatore's going, why are you giving it all away? I will eat all that. <laughs> There's only so much you can, I mean, he can get through a lot. No, no, I mean, yeah, he's like, no, what? And I said, don't be ridiculous, you know. So we always, we always give our leftovers away happily. Yeah, I mean. But you're not, you're not going to be far from me with your new restaurant, so I'll shimmy over. You don't need to shimmy over, I'm coming. <laughs> you don't need to shimmy over. But I think you probably are responsible for the gentrification and the increase in house prices in that part of the world. No, God, no. That was happening before Everybody wants me. to... Yeah, I know. That's everybody I, wants to be nearby. Yeah, exactly. I did say something. I made some quippy in some article about um, neighbours spending their Saturday afternoon looking at house prices, and one of them said, how did you know? <laughs> and I said, isn't that what everyone does in London? Just look at that, you know. It's our national pastime yeah, exactly. and our birthright. Yeah, this is what exactly. we do. It's what they do, yeah. Uh, okay, the stage is yours, guys. You have the questions. Angela has the answers. Oh, the roving mic that. is kicking around somewhere. Oh. You could. Was kicking around somewhere? You can shout. You want to hold on? on? Angela, I've got your problem. Is nobody believes I'm a Londoner. I'll just say that. Yes, okay, there you go. Yeah, are you, are you, you, you pass as Welsh as well? <laughs> Irish. <laughs> Irish, yeah. During the pandemic, did anybody think to teach basic cooking skills to anybody? Now, I've been on loads of cooking courses, and my food is still quite a flop. Yeah. My husband was a good cook, but he was Hungarian. Yeah. But it's just got worse. Okay. <laughs> do you want? Um, yeah. I, I we, think we, we don't want to. We don't want to be on your contact. List. Yeah. <laughs> don't call us. I think lots of people did. I don't think there was any. Um, um, you know, because the BBC did a lot of things for uh, in COVID. I think what they had, and it's whether you're on the social media nonsense thing, 
of Instagram. There were a lot of chefs doing lots of Instagram posts, I think, weren't there? I mean, I had friends that would do a post every day. I think I did one and thought, I cannot do this. God, what a nightmare. Uh, you know, the thought of having to do it every day and enthusiastically. So, but you're right, there were many missed opportunities and that could have been a very good one. I regret, as we were laughing about the other day, we had a party, I don't know, a few months ago, and we had a friend over with kids. And I do what I'm sure everyone in this room does, and maybe not admit, that when you have a party, you don't actually clear up, you just throw it all in a spare room. And I literally, you know, just move all the crap from downstairs, one floor up and put it in a room. Kids were there, so in the next room, we put them in the TV room. But obviously kids are kids and they wander around and they came running downstairs going, Mum, 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 Angela's got a room just like you, Mum, where you put all your rubbish. <laughs> And I was in front of everyone. I said, all right, all right, steady on. Kate goes, yeah, yeah I'll done. see what you do. So, But, yeah, I think that could have been a good thing, actually. But I'll tell you the best person, Delia Smith. Honestly, if you can get her stuff online or buy her books, I think one of her recipes absolutely work, without a shadow of a doubt. And she's very clear instructions. Honestly, I swear by Delia. There's still hope. Yeah, still hope. <laughs> there is in her. <laughs> I think this is where we as restaurateurs come in. Yeah. I think we failed you maybe as recipe writers, but we will cook for you. Mm. Yeah. Uh, next questions, roving mic. Ah, oh. yeah. Sounds very convivial and great fun. Are you equally sociable at breakfast? Oh, God, no. <laughs> I, um, I don't like... Uh, I have a cup of coffee... And I don't like chatting in the morning. <laughs> and um, and my uh, and it's not often we're all there at the weekend, but there was a while my sister was living with us, and Anne likes to chat in the morning. Neil definitely likes to chat, and I would just literally pick my coffee up and leave the room. You know, so I'm not a sociable breakfast person. No. I mean, I will say there is no breakfast yeah, there's chapter here. There's no. Yeah. That's. <laughs> I think that. I didn't thing. notice yeah, it. Yeah, there is no, no, no nothing about breakfast. No, no. So um, thank you so much. That was amazing. And thank your book you. gives us the license as home cooks to kind of be home cooks. Yeah. One of the criticisms that chefs get is that they're too chefy, but right. home cooks get criticised that they're not elevated enough. Right. So how would you advise us as home cooks dealing with hangry hordes and you know super hangry children? How do we elevate our food on a daily basis when we don't have very much time? So practical tips oh that's a good one um why do you feel you need to elevate it for your family if you're cooking for them every night they should be grateful for it <laughs> ignorant right yeah. it's that's... just personal pressure you know where you... Mm. um personal pressure i suppose it's the word we were using pimp it up i sort of think um i don't know i, d I don't actually if i'm honest believe in elevating food i mean i think part of the problem is and even though it's done my career well is all these food shows, especially the likes of MasterChef, make everyone think that you have to do a smear and a swirl and all the rest of it, which is absolutely a load of old rubbish, quite frankly. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you want to offer a plate of food that's delicious. And that's really what I think is the best thing about it. And so, and for me, when we have people at home, we, my favourite thing is I don't even plate up. I never, I mean, I might, at my, if, I suppose I'm at the table, I'll bring a bowl of pasta up and I might serve it in front of everyone. But I do not have plating in the kitchen. Any of We put, literally put it in the middle of the table and everyone helps themselves. And I think that's the way to do it because you want to have a good time. So that's how I would do it with your family. I would just give them a great, delicious plate of food and tell them to cook it themselves if they're going to, honestly. <laughs> I mean, if I said that to my problem. mother, she'd be like, are you kidding me? You know, but um, no, and I think, and I, and I actually think um, food's there to be enjoyed. Yes, it wants to be appetising and, and it wants to be colourful, I suppose, it appeal of the eye, but ultimately, you don't remember that. You remember what it tastes like and it's just going to be delicious and, and just, you know, stick, cook seasonally. It will be cheaper and, and then you don't have to mess around with it. I hope that helps. I mean, uh, let's talk you about chef eating. I think that always <laughs> the worst home meal is better than a very good restaurant meal. Yeah. Maybe not yours. But <laughs> <laughs> maybe, like most times, I prefer yeah. home food than restaurant food. Yeah, and actually I did this thing with... Um, Sorry. Yeah. 
No, but I think that's it because there's not to say there's no care gone into a restaurant meal, but when someone makes you a home meal, I think you really are putting yourself out there in a way. And I think, you know, there's more effort. I feel goes into it because especially if someone's not a cook or they don't like doing it and someone's cooked for you I yeah. think that's a really big deal yeah. I agree yeah where are you on chefy tweezers I don't use them okay. I'm not no but like listen I'm going to put my hands up a lot of my chefs at Murano they do they even bought me a pair for Christmas that's very nice but they won't get used <laughs> and they laugh because I, st I dress with my hands and they make and you know M she's brilliant she's a great head chef and she runs it and I can absolutely trust her to do it brilliantly but they do like the old tweezer and then they laugh when I run the pass because I just use a spoon in my hands and they're there and I say, give me those blood, and I literally, Poof. and they're like, and I said, it still looks good, you know, I'm not going to send out rub, you know, but sometimes I'm, I'm like the urgency of, come on, because I will be more worried that it gets cold. That will yeah. be my thing while they're, anyway. I, I, I just, get a nice yeah. bleed. Microherbs? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> It's got to taste good. Giorgio Locatelli always said that you ne only put something on a plate that you're going to eat everything, and it's and it's and it's it's got a purpose. I don't see the point because they don't taste of anything. If they taste of anything, no. yeah, then but they don't. See Bakhton? No, not me. Who How is that legal? Yeah, no, foraging. Uh, I don't even. No. That's too much, <laughs> especially when someone's foraged. At a restaurant east, there's all be foraged in Victoria Park. That's where I take my dog for a walk. I'm like, why do I want to know that? And why do I want to eat this food? Anyway, I won't mention the restaurant, but it's just like, mm. there's, Wash carefully. Yeah, there's yeah. foraging and foraging. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we hit the elderflower. But they're quite I love high, elderflower. Yeah. yeah, I get elderflower. Wild garlic, Luke brings yeah. from the new forest. Yeah, no, there are certain things, you know. New but, Forest, Clapham Common, whatever. Yeah, same yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a slight same difference. level of cleanliness. Yeah, whatever. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, roving Mike. Hey, yeah. Uh. Angela, the book's fantastic. Thank you. Alongside Delia, what are the other cookery books you buy for friends and family? Do you want me um, to leave the room for that? Yeah, well, to be honest, I do buy. I've bought their books um, for the chefs at work because the chefs at work, especially at Murano, I always buy them a book for Christmas, but they'll always buy chefy books. So I buy them, not that you're, it, it's not an un chefy book, but I buy them books that are just about delicious food. And, you know, I love the book Honey and Co. I think they're brilliant. They are, they are amazing. They're, and I, 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 and they're books I will refer to. Um, and if you haven't bought their barbecuing book, the way you do that ribeye is brilliant. And actually, I used that. I did that whole sauce. Really? Pig, yeah, the one with the red peppers and everything. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. The reverse, um, uh, so yeah. I like Simon Hopkinson. I mentioned him earlier. I think he's a great cookery writer. I like Nigel Slater. Um, uh, who else do I like? I like it for Italian food. She's uh, unfortunately... Da dead now, Marcella Hassan. I mean, she's old school Italian food, but I think it's brilliant. And and I like and I quite like, even though all our publishers will hate me for it. I like books with no pictures. I quite like the old school. Yeah. school. I mean, everyone yeah. wants pictures, but I quite like the idea you don't necessarily have a picture for every recipe. Um, who else? Yeah, and I I tend to and actually she's great food writer, Georgina Hayden. Yeah. She, I, I, I only recently got to know her, but I think she writes really well and I love her recipes. And I think it's very much how we think, you know, big families, big plates of food on the table. So, yeah. And also the thing is recipes are a guide. You know, you can use them and substitute stuff. You know, Yotam has great recipes, but, you know, I love him, but bloody hell, you know. <laughs> a lot of ingredients you know and um but i've even you know but then that's trusting yourself you know i mean we did his shawarma lamb which i'm sure you know you know and it is delicious and there's so many ingredients and in something like that i wouldn't but other rings i think you know if you want to substitute it with someone else something else don't feel afraid to you know it's what you want to do you know yeah with our recipe don't change don't change yeah. that. <laughs> i was just kidding do whatever you want you stick to the recipe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you have like a stack of cookbooks by the bed? Oh, they're everywhere. It's yeah. just ridiculous. Literally. Yeah, they're everywhere. I keep 
you know, just we've got this outhouse, which again, we had the whole of lockdown to sort out, and yet we didn't, um, which in trying to get them all. And I realised I'd bought books over time for all the guys at the restaurant, and I bought too many. So I've got like four of Jamie's it's Italy book, and I've got probably, you know, five of Neves's support, you know, so I need to just basically, I keep saying to all the new kids, I've got to bring all these books into a bargain, ten or a book, and just give them to them, you know, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So. That's a, a whole level, like we don't hold, we don't, you know, buy wholesale, but <laughs> actually we do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, questions from the Rovers. Oh, so many Rovers. Yeah. Hi. I'm interested in the process of... Um, Where am I looking? Hello. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah. Because you've included other people's recipes in your book, yeah. did they cook it for you or just write it down and you cooked it back for them? Or what was the process to make oh, sure? Oh, I see. Well, Nick had, um, it depends who it was. So uh, uh, Basil, who has Basil's ham in there, Basil cooked it one Christmas for us. And then I, and as I said, Basil, I want to put your ham in the recipe. I guess I can't remember, darling. Blah, 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 blah. So I came up with a recipe and then said, Are you approve this and happy. Nick wrote his recipe for me. Randall did, Steve did, Jonathan did, Katie did. So it was only Basil, actually, that I had to write the recipe for. Everyone else gave me their recipe. Then I, I tried it, checked I was happy with it, and then put it in the book. Did you make so, any changes? No, I didn't, actually. The only I, I made, because I think when someone doesn't write recipes they're very like lots of description I cut things out not cut things out I just made it simpler yeah. yeah exactly streamlined it but generally they are their recipes yeah yeah no Basil was actually around my house earlier going where's my book I don't remember giving <laughs> you that recipe and I said well to be fair you didn't I wrote it I mean I just remember the night we had it which was delicious except for the ridiculous amount of gratinated leeks he did. I mean, like, literally like that. Yeah, I've yeah. never seen a pot like it. It still scares me when I think <laughs> about it. Yeah. But did you meet any resistance? In no. The recipes? Everybody was happy I think everyone to was very happy to it. Yeah, yeah, they were. They were very... And there's lovely, like, John and Sandy, who... Um, have allotments, yeah, there's an artichoke soup and there's a couple of, and that, they were their artichokes, not necessarily their recipes, but, you know, every certain yeah. times of the year you get a little delivery outside your door and that's John and Sandy have brought their stuff from the allotments. So, did, you, yeah. did you get the reverse saying, oh, yeah, you know, just yeah. people <laughs> dropping by saying, oh, yeah, maybe for your book, I hear you do it, maybe you want my recipe. Yeah. No, I'm good, yeah. No, no, I haven't, I didn't have any of don't, that. No, we yeah. don't have enough babies, yeah, no, sorry. No, 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 fortunately I didn't have any of that, yeah. Probably will now, now it come, people will come up to me and go, well, why didn't you ask me? Well, I don't, so yeah. it's probably going to cause a lot of uh, anger. But anyway. I mean, I think probably in the follow-up, Oh, right, follow People up. are going to be like, and I made you yeah. this. It would be a great recipe book, because then I won't have to do much. It's like, give me a recipe, I'll test it. Copy yeah. and paste. Co copy and yeah. paste, done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> give me the money. Uh, speaking of borrowed recipe, that chocolate cake, though. Oh, Randall's, yeah. Oof. That is good, yeah. I mean... I mean, Randall, I mean, to be fair to Randall, he, every um, Christmas, he bakes goods for the for your Christmas, you know, he'll bring you a little something or other and a little note with it. And I'm terrible, you know, I barely put a card through people's doors. Yeah. Um, but Randall is very good. So um, I did. I told him the other day, I said, it's looking good. And he's like, he loves it, he's a baker. Yeah, yeah. it looks It is good, incredible. it is very I'm not, good. I'm not allowed to sort of praise other people's cakes in my... <laughs> <laughs> My wife doesn't, doesn't like it, but so I, I was kind of like hesitant to bring it up. You can do it when you come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. it's very um, appealing cake. You will see it all. Uh, Rovers, we have a beautiful nope, that way. group. Oh. <coughs> Thank you. Um, question for both of you. No. Oh. What's your favourite dish? Oh, favourite dish. Go on. There's this uh, chocolate cake recipe <laughs> that I just came across. Um, mine, it would be something with chocolate. I have really? To say. Yeah. Okay. You've yeah. got a sweet tooth. Not really, but chocolate is my thing, and chocolate okay. cakes in particular. All that's right, there you go. my thing, and I'm happy to be very open and invite all chocolate cakes to my table. Okay. Sorry? 
I haven't tried this yet. I just saw the recipe, but my top one, and my wife is going to kill me. Uh, it's called the Midnight Chocolate Cake from Samin's book, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. Yeah. And it's super simple. It's like a, you know, a child's birthday cake. I don't think yeah. it, it even has chocolate. I think it's just cocoa. So it, correct me if I'm wrong or right. Huh? It has chocolate. It has chocolate, but not like, it's not like, but I'm just like, that's me done. That's you done. That's me done. Nigella does a really good one, I try. Guinness but, one. No, this one has um, sour cream in. Mm. That's a really good one. I tried yeah. that one, yeah. But is, Randall's is pretty good. Yeah. Is there something that's not improved by sour cream? <laughs> yeah, no, I love sour cream. Sour cream, cream is so good. Yeah, it's I do. So good. I do like it. Um, roast chicken, I think. I'm savoury. I'm not a big sweet person. I like savoury, so a good roast chicken, if I'm absolutely honest. Because there's many things after it. I like the next day. Like, for me, Christmas is much better on Boxing Day because you have all the leftovers. So that's my thing. What makes a good roast chicken? A good chicken, for a start. It doesn't have to be. Um, and I think just crispy skin, nice and moist. And don't, you know, again, just rosemary and lemon and a bit of garlic, and that's it. You don't need to put too much else. Salt and pepper, done. Then there's a really, again, one of the recipes that I clocked from here is the Neil's roast chicken. Neil, yeah, Neil does it. He yeah. joints it all down. And, that's a, and, it, and it, it does work. He takes a whole chicken, he'll joint it down. And then he literally will empty the fridge. You know, you'll have the odd potato or tomato or something, whatever's in the fridge. He cuts, washes it all, cuts it all up, and then just puts all, browns the chicken, puts all of that on the veg and just puts it in the oven. So all those juices go onto all that veg. And we must have had that about 100 times. And so it, and it's Sunday night chicken, because that's what we have on a Sunday night. But is, you know, again, it's a very simple thing, but just yeah. cutting it up. Yeah. And roasting it like this, it kind of like protects you from drying. Yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah. It really works. And also presentation. Again, you just like on no the cutlery. Table. Just, yeah, or done. Just, yeah. Yeah. But the slices of lemon, mm. I'm, I'm there for it. <laughs> yeah. Completely. Thank you. I, I was looking at your recipe after Neil as well, the one where you're boiling it in the casserole. How much pressure does the Michelin star system put on the restaurant industry? Oh, well, hello, you two. How are you? Yeah. They're good regulars. Um, it, it does put pressure. It's two-way fold. It's great to have it because it's great. As you know, we've got great staff at Murano, and one of the reasons they work there is because we have a star, without doubt, and they want really? that on there. Yeah, I think for chefs especially, I think they want that on their sort of CV. Um, and I think it's about um, just... And, and Michelin, I think everyone misunderstands it to a degree. I think... The first star is about consistency. It's that simple. Um, it sounds that simple. I don't mean it like that. But just making sure that every time they come in, if they have a lemon tart, it's equally the same every single time they come in. And you know, and it's not about the service or the wine list or the tablecloth or anything like that. It's about consistency of food. The second star they talk about that they start to see the definition of the chef. So if you think about people who have two stars. Um, you've got um, Sat Baines, you've got um, Claude Bosset, you know, you can identify their food. And if you look at a three-star chef, they say you could do a blind tasting and no, identify that chef. So you could say Gordon Ramsay Restaurant, Claire, um, the Fat Duck, etc. So I sort of always do look at that and I think that's how it is. Listen, we have a star. Um, I don't think I'd want to lose it because it is, does, you know, bring certain benefits, I suppose, it, to the restaurant. And I think it's good for the team. But there is a pressure to make sure for certainly that you want to get everything right in the kitchen. And, there, and I'll be honest, there was a time that we were changing chefs and we had a new chef and it, he just wasn't into it. And we had a really bad report um, and they came in and they called him aside and I wasn't at the restaurant that day. And then I get a phone call going, Michelin have been in, and this is what they said. And I read it, and I went, oh, my God. But I've, you know, fortunately had a star since I started at the Connaught, so, God, near on 20 years now. And I, and I think the clever thing is, to, is, it's like, to me, they're like customers at the end of the day. Yes, they're writing a report. Yes, people can read it. But they are customers, and they didn't have a great experience. So I treated them like I would if I read a complaint on Seven Rooms. And I emailed them, and I said, I'm sorry you didn't have a good time. The blah, 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 blah. Next time you're in town, can we meet? And they did. And we, the chef had changed. They came to another inspection. 
they saw me and they said, listen, Andrew, and they were quite honest. They said, we know you've been with us. We realised it was a blip, but we just wanted you to be aware of that blip, you know. And I, th and I actually thought that was credit to them to do that because, but they were quite honest. They said, if you had been a new restaurant, we'd given a start last year, you'd probably have lost it. You know, I mean, it wasn't, they, you know, we let ourselves down. We're not perfect. No one can, I'm sure there's times you guys have been that things haven't been right, you know, but hopefully we've rectified it or Laura's charmed you enough. <laughs> you know, but it is front of house, you know. I mean, that's where, you know, Laura's been with me nearly 12 years now and she's amazing, you know, and, but she knows the regular, she knows what people want, you know, and, but you need those, you need, it's not, it's not, that's the great thing about, I think, our business these days. When I started, it was the chef, the chef, oh my God. Now it's not. It's about just great food and it's about great service. You know, I will go back to a restaurant nine times out of ten because the service is as brilliant as the, the food. And if the service is bad, I won't go near it again. That will, I'll forgive a bit of cold pasta or something, you know, it's not, you know, but I won't, if someone's rude or when I walk in, and not because... I'm in the business, but you know when you walk in, someone's like, yes, and you're like, are you kidding me? Eye contact, could you just look at me? I think, you know, why? You don't want to be here, so why are you here, you know? And to be fair, I think London, we're pretty good at our service, no? I think we're a friendly bunch. I think we are a friendly bunch, yeah. yeah. And, but that, to me... We don't, I mean, we don't have that reputation. No, I think sometimes I've been to New York and I've felt that a little bit. Oh, my God. Yeah. There's a corner in hell for <laughs> New York restaurant hosts. And London estate agents. Yes! Brilliant. But I feel that it's like, why do you have I to be so that. mean to me? I just want to... They really Don't show! That's like... It's so So true. small. There was twice two restaurants I went to and they literally, like, she didn't look up and I was like, hello? It's like, for, but the thing is, they're so packed out there, they get away with it, which is shocking. I mean, yeah, it really was, shocking. I don't know, I don't get it. It's just like an yeah. eviscerating experience. Yeah, yeah. And it, and I don't like New York. Well, my brother's there, and I, actually I'm there in a week's time to get to my nephew's graduations. But there's a few restaurants I know that I'll go to, but I sort of love the vibe of it. But I've, I've, I've grown in confidence. Where I think New York do do it brilliantly, years ago I went to, out there and I did some stages. And that was, you know, I literally rocked up to restaurants and said, I'm, I've just finished working with Gordon Ramsay, can I get him and do a day in your kitchen, blah, blah, blah. And then you'd eat at restaurants. And, they have, and I think we have it now, but we didn't for a while, that great bar scene where people sat yeah. at the bar and ate. And I remember going into Gramercy Tavern, chatting away, and I was, you know, because I was staying with my brother, but he was working. And my brother's like, what are you doing today? So you felt you had to give him my itinerary. Oh, well, I'm getting up and I'm going for breakfast and I'm going for lunch. And I, you know, and I'd go off for lunch. And, I, and then I was chatting, and the guy goes, oh, you've got to go and eat here. And then he'd go, here's my bar, my mate's the barman, I'll get you a reservation. You know, and I think we've got that now, but for a while yeah. we didn't. I think that's where they're great New York restaurants. But there are other things they could do better, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. London estate agents. Got to hear that story. Yeah, I mean, how long have you got? <laughs> uh, where are you going to eat in New York, just out of curiosity? There's a great place called um, Via Carotta, which is yeah. great. And very friendly, actually. Very friendly. First, yeah, Therese, the only friendly yeah. place. Um, a place called Resdauza, 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 who's this guy from Emilia Romagna background, which is where my grandparents came from. That I uh, would definitely go. We had a brilliant meal there. You're writing this down, everyone. And uh, Estella, Estella, Estella. Estella is so good. That's so good. Oh yeah. my god. So those three and friendly probably, and very friendly. They're great friendly. Yeah. Although one of the waiters did say, and actually he is a great friend. I've got his mobile number on my phone and stuff. But we sort of went to take a picture. He said, Don't take a picture of me. We said we're not. We're taking a picture of us. But that was the only odd thing about him. But after that, he was fine. <laughs> I don't know why. We sort of it just sort of threw us, you know, because we were like, we yeah. don't want a picture of you. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah. His book's fantastic as yeah. well. Yeah, his yeah. book is brilliant. Yeah. The Andy yeah. salad. Yeah. Oh my God. Mm. It's true, um, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. I'm just, I just and think the about the salad yeah. like so three times good, a day. Yeah. Uh, what were you we talking about? Um, Michelin stars. Ah, yeah. Yes. Did we answer the question? I think so. Yeah. You're happy with that answer? Thank you. <laughs> uh, do you like the sort of high Michelin experience? Do you go to the... Uh, I will if I'm go taking some of the cooks out or the chefs out and stuff. Um, 
I do and I don't. I just sort of a bit past being told how to eat stuff, and um, and people, and I, well, there's two things, isn't there? There's age that I, there's when I first started going out to lots of restaurants 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and I was looking around Europe and trying to find or see different restaurants. I could go for lunch and dinner. I can't. I mean, I can still eat a lot, but I can't do that. I struggle to do two meals in a day. Yeah. And I don't want to be there at a table for five hours, you know, anymore. You know, I'd like to sort of, you know, two and a half, three, you know, and, and not every 30 seconds be told um, this is what you're eating or mouthfuls. I just want a meal. I just want a proper palette of food. And, and the best, and even though I've done a lot of them, like El Boulet, which is the big one in, um, in Spain or was in Spain, Ferran Adrian, and I was going with a group of chefs. Phil was one of them. And John Campbell, and I don't think John will mind me telling this story. And the night before I had won, um, had I, won the sh I think I'd won Chef of the Year award at the Katie's. And I ended up with a friend of mine, you, and in uh, the electric club in Notting Hill <laughs> till the early hours of the morning and missed my flight the next day <laughs> to El Boule. To many flights I've missed in my life. Anyway, I still thought, God, I'm going to go. So I got on the next flight. And then I can just hear my wife, like, my wife's appreciation of you going down like this. <laughs> I, can just, I can just see What? It because I'm late? Because you're late for flights. Oh, my God, I'm late. She's, I'm... Not, she's now in her head thinking, oh, I like her a lot less now. I, I missed two flights in one day once, two flights at the same airport. Oh, no, it's, it's a prize I'm very good at. It's, it's a talent. But missing the flight to El Bulli, that's, yeah, that's so a that's, biggie. Yeah, that's a biggie. So I basically missed it. Then I got on the next flight. I'd called Kirsty, who was organising it. And prior to that, I'd already said to Kirsty, I'd primed her up. I said, when I go there, do not put me next to John Campbell. And I said, John, I love you, but you're going to take photos, you're going to write notes, and you're going to ruin my experience. I just want to eat food and just enjoy it. And... Um, and so I get on my cab and I'm blowing it. So I get there and this is where amazing service, even though they were already an hour and a bit into the meal or maybe even two hours into the meal, this is a five hour meal. They start me from the beginning. <laughs> they literally still do every course that they've given Phil and everyone around the table. And I, so I catch up to them. I'm not near John writing all his notes, so I'm even more happy. And I'm at the end of the table just catching up, eating in the time I want. Because they're sort of doing the rest of the table, I'm not getting all the this is this, although, of course, they do tell me, and it's amazing. And afterwards, Phil says to me, he goes, you jammy cow, how did you manage that? I said, it's brilliant, wasn't it? I said, El Boulay in three hours, and I didn't have to sit next to John. And I, you know... <laughs> Because, you know, and to me that is, you know, like lots of people, we went to um, Noma, you know, back in the day uh, when I think it was a two star and it, you still ordered a la carte, you know. And, you know, and a lot of people, and that, I think that's the, that I feel really bad for chefs when they get to this two, three star level that everyone's a critic saying, oh, yeah, I went there, it wasn't a three star. Level. And it's like, well, you know, come on, who really knows? And, um, and we just go with the attitude, and now I still do that with Neil. We just went and had a great time. And we got there at one, we left at five. There was more bottles, and there's two bottles per all of us at the table. There's about six or eight of us. We knew half the chefs in the kitchen because loads of English chefs were doing stages. And, you know, we had a brilliant experience, you know. And I think that you've got to go to those places, not as these gastronomic, you know, temples, but you're going for a night out, so enjoy fun. yourself. Yeah. And, that, and actually, I think the more I go to places like that, the more people who work in them want you to do that. Yeah. I don't think anyone wants to serve anyone going, you know, yeah. it's not fun, is it? They want it, you want to engage, yeah. you know. I'd like to think so anyway, because it's hospitality. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like the split between yeah. impress or yeah. entertain. I don't know. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a difficult one. Yeah, that was interesting. Yeah. Lady that. I'm just wondering if chefs can in any way encourage people to eat the cheaper cuts of meat that you don't see any longer in supermarkets, you can only get in butchers. Scrag end of neck makes the best lamb stew there ever yeah. was. Um, some of the, the, the cheaper beef cuts. Yeah. Is there some way that chefs who are always on the TV, one yeah. or another, can encourage people to go back to eating that, which is, you know, time of austerity is going to be a lot easier for people to be able to afford but they've got to understand it because you know it, 
it, it does take a little bit longer. To yeah. But um, it's not it's not poison. No, I mean we've got a lamb next to you in this book, which is that thing, you know, and it's that the sort of haggis recipe. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah, and it, it and you're absolutely right. And I always think the judgment of a good chef is not just taking the prime cuts. Because it's easy to take the prime cuts and just roast a bit of fillet or something. The clever chef will take lamb neck, lamb shank, you know, um, shin of beef, that sort of thing. So um, I think, yeah, I mean, I'd like to think we are more responsible. There's certainly a lot of brazing in there because, again, I think home cooking, who wants to be sitting there, you know, saying to people, medium, rare, well done, you know, whereas actually you can put it all in a pan, cook it for hours, and it's going to be more delicious than a fillet or something like that. So I think that's a good thing. Ironically, certain things that probably would have been eaten 20, 30, well, 30, 40 years ago, like sweetbreads, like veal shank, are now very expensive to buy in a restaurant, even though you can't buy it in a supermarket, but it's a very may come much more of a fashionable thing. But I think kidneys and stuff like that are delicious. I love those sort of things, you know, when they're done. Nana Corinda big on her offal? And... Not so much offal, but certainly slow cooking. Slow cooking, stew she would make a lot of. And even my mum the other day, I bought her some shin. And this is how the, you know, I bought the shin. I left it to Neil to make. He did the first stage. He left it to Salvatore to finish. It gets to my mum and she says to me, it was awful. And I was <laughs> like, what? And she goes, it wasn't cooked enough. And between the pair of them, they hadn't, you know, but it is that whole thing of slow cooking. But I think there's, I think there's a lot of chefs that do do it in their restaurants, but probably don't do it enough on TV. You're absolutely right. Your house sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> does. You, you've got to, well, we'll get our dates together because I've been telling you you've got to come over. Yeah. She's been, you heard that, yeah? Yeah, witness. You have it on witness. record? Yeah. Yeah, we have witnesses. Uh, there was more question. Yes, the lovely... Lady down the front there. Yeah. It's nice to know it'll be so light when we go out, won't it? I know. I love you summer know, now. Summer in, in this country? Yeah. Yeah. Magic. Hello. Sorry, my dear. That's okay. Hello. Yes. Hello. Any tips for um, cooking gluten free pasta? Oh, that's a good one, actually. I've got to be honest, I'm not the best at that. But there's a great dish. It's not in this book, but if you look it up, uh, it's buckwheat flour, which is gluten free. Um, and it's called pizzoccheri. And it's from the Lombardia region. And it's more wintry, but you could do it with a great gluten-free um, uh, pasta. And basically, it's the simplest ingredients, but made delicious. So you have diced cabbage, you know, roughly diced, boiled potatoes, diced boiled potatoes and sage. And you basically cook your buckwheat pasta, mix all the potato. And because you've cooked them, they start to break down to form the sauce around mm. the pasta. You've got your cabbage sage in there and then fontina cheese and a lot of the time they sort of do it like that and then put it in a dish and then bake it in the oven so and that is a delicious sort of great one for summary yeah. yeah it's not very summery it's very wintry <laughs> this is the one that the stanley tucci wrote about in the book he might have done actually yeah, yeah he might that. have done i've read parts of it not all yeah, of it yeah. yeah i think he goes a little bit but about pete soccer is a great one and i think you know there's some great gluten-free pasta brands out there i mean i'll be honest with you we don't make our own gluten-free pasta but we do have it available but um so there's lots out there to use pleasure Hi, Angela. Um, Hi. First of all, we eat in all your restaurants and they're Thank fabulous. You. And Itamar, your cookbooks are terrific. So Thank, Thank you so much. You tell me that. Um, I've Continue, got... yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 you can go on, it's fine. Yeah, we can, we can do it. Great. Yeah. Your wife, she's like this up there, yeah. like this. <laughs> she's like this for the last 20 years. It's fine, Angela. She's used to it. So, Angela, you, you, you touched on there about going to restaurants and having mouthfuls of food. Um, on social media this week, there's been circulating um, from a Kardashian wedding uh, a plate of pasta, which was just about a forkful, and everyone was ridiculing it. So my question is, do you weigh your pasta when you serve it at home? And if so, what would you consider to be 
an adequate portion per person. Oh, God. So, um, a Kardashian portion of his... Uh, I didn't see portion. that um, on social. So you get your normal half kilo, 500 gram bags, say of rigatoni or penne or something. We probably do for four of us one of those bags, I'd say. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't weigh it. The only thing I do weigh, my sister-in-law bought me this... Um, it's like a plastic thing and for spaghetti, and it's there's one portion, two portions, three portions. Although I did the two portion the other day for Neil and I, and it was loads. Um, so, uh, but we don't. I sort of do it, what they call allocchio. I mean, I do it, and Salvatore goes, come on, it's not enough, I'll eat it. So we'll always, and, and we do eat the next day, I always put cold pasta in. There is a lot to be said for cold pasta. Yeah, it's there? not it's bad, yeah. One of life's... Yeah. Uh, mm. You know, with the when it yeah with the, the crunchiness, sauce. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. mind the old cold pasta dish, yeah. Yeah. But I think, yeah, no. What's the point of that? I mean, yeah, no. I think to be fair, that forkful of pasta has more carbs than they had yeah. in the yeah. last twenty years. So, yeah. You know, and it's yeah. only was it a first wedding? Just a first wedding, so you know. <laughs> worth get worth waiting for the next yeah. marriage for more pasta. These people. The next wedding. Uh, yes. Online. Online. Oh, cranky. Are we taking online people? Mm. What is what is the world coming to? <laughs> <laughs> right, so Peggy um, would like to know a question to, to both of you. Um, connections seem more important than ever. Do you think attending cooking school to embark on a good career in food is a must? Um, on top of other obvious criteria like really committed, always hungry to learn, etc. To go to a cooking school, to go in a cookery school. Um, I don't think it's a must, if I'm honest. I think it depends how much. I think, for me, when anyone ever says to me, oh, my son or daughter or whoever, I want to go into cooking, I say, to, my advice is go to a big kitchen or a hotel kitchen to do all your basics because, and spend a good two years there. You know, if you could become an apprentice at somewhere like, you know, or the Gavroche or the Ritz, even though they're fancier restaurants, you'll learn everything. I think, or you go to, a, or decide what cuisine you want to do. If you want to do, you know, Middle Eastern cuisine, you go and work for these guys, you go to Yotam, you know, and you, st but I think the key is you stay somewhere for over a year because you see the seasons and too many people go, oh, I'll do six months. What's the point of doing six months? You don't see winter, you don't see the summer, you don't see a season of cooking in a restaurant. So that to me is key. Yeah. What do you think? What's your? I think... Maybe I would always advise for someone to be like a dentist and make lots of money. <laughs> this is a much better way of enjoying your food. I, mean, it's not a, I mean, I'm enjoying my work, but it's not a great career, is it? Oh, dear. Uh, <laughs> Please, thank No, but it's, I, I yeah. never went to chef school. No, I, I agree didn't. with Angela. Go to a big kitchen. Start on Monday. If you're there by Wednesday, then it's probably for you. Yeah. You will know by Wednesday. Yeah, it's say. true. Yeah. Bike you know shoes. very quickly if you. Yeah. 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 I know. And definitely, I think what you said is so important: sticking to the one kitchen. Yeah. And learning. Yeah. What they do. Yeah. You know, in a deep, meaningful way for for a year or two is is so important. And do you know we just did a dinner with these local college students down in um, Bournemouth? Uh, no. Portsmouth way. And um, we were saying to them, they're third year students, I said, what are you doing? They're like, I don't know, I don't know. I said, right, spend the next few months going to visit kitchens, go and see. And I said, it doesn't matter what you do. Because one goes, I'll work in McDonald's. I said, I worked in McDonald's when I was a student. I said, it's not the end of the world. I said, but whatever you do, if you want to go and make pizzas, if you want to go and do Michelin, if you want to go and work in a care home, you want to, whatever you do, just be the best at it. Make the best pizza, make the best burger. Don't do second best, that's my point. And I sort of said, but you don't need to, you don't have to come to a restaurant. You know, there's so many other ways you can cook if you want yeah. to. Yeah, and, and actually McDonald's chefs are always amazing. You know, yeah. they're really, it's really structured and... Yeah, what they do. No, but I didn't get any yellow stars, I was really bad. Is that a thing? I hated, I, li I worked hard, but I didn't like that you had to talk in a code. Like, you know, rather than say, you know, I need four Big Macs, you'd go, I need 4.29, 33, and I'm okay.
can I not just say, I need four Big Macs? You know, why do I have to talk? And I used to get really, and they'd go, Angela, you know, and they'd walk past you and go, sell up, sell up. And because it was Upminster where I knew, I knew the people, I'm not selling up, so I really, my uncle said to me, he goes, I can't believe you didn't get farther than your green badge, Angela. <laughs> I said it became a pride of place with my friend Nicola and I that we refused to do. And we did it for a summer because we needed the money. But I would always go, can I have three cheeseburgers? And they go, can you? Just do it in the McDonald's it's very, lingo. It's very army, isn't it? Yes, yeah. And I, I, I didn't, yeah. I yeah. probably would have got fired if I hadn't left. But anyway, it was fun. It was good. I mean... Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. We, we, we digress. Sorry. Where were yeah. we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? There's one lady. There. Do we have do we have time? Or are we going to yeah. be cautious? Let's do the last one. I'll be quick. Um, where do you stand on having cheese with seafood with pasta? Ah. Oh. Well, I'll be honest with you. Wow, the most controversial for last. Well, I t so I um I uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, if you'd asked me that eighteen months ago, I would have gone no, no, no. It's like having pineapple on a pizza. There you go. That's the other thing, or coriander. My other pet hate. Um, <laughs> But there's um, um, an amazing restaurant in the island of Burano in Venice, in the Veneto area, called Gatto Nero, um, uh, run by some dear friends of mine, their son Massimiliano. And they, were, they cook a lot in the seahorse down in Dartmouth with Mitch Tonks, and every year they go down there. And last year they were down there, and it, uh, uh, Mitch does this festival, the Dartmouth Food Festival, and they were cooking. And, you know, we were all invited to go as guests. And actually, I said to Mitch, I just want to go and cook with the mum and dad. Can I just go in the kitchen with them? He goes, yeah, sure, you know, come on. I said, no, no, I just want to go and cook with them. And they made this amazing pasta with this uh, pacari. So it's quite, it's sort of like a big rigatoni, but quite round. And they had clams in there, langoustine, um, mussels, um, uh, squid and stuff like that. And they made this gorgeous sauce, tiny little bit of chilli. All the packery goes in, it's all cooked together, a little bit of parsley and stuff like that. And at the end, a little bit of parmesan. And I went, whew. But actually, as he said, the key is parmesan acted as the seasoning. You didn't get all that cheesy flavour because parmesan is salt, and, you know, they acted as the seasoning. So since then, I say yes. <laughs> See? <laughs> Um, that's it. You learn something new every day. Yeah. Not learn something yeah. new, but you change. You yeah. grow, you know, you, you move forward. How are you, how you with fish and butter? I like fish and butter. Okay. Yeah? You don't like fish and butter or you like fish and olive oil? Yeah, I, I struggle with the butter. I like I it with struggle, certain but fish. Like... But, but normally we cook everything in, like, olive oil, you yeah. know, and then maybe certain dishes, if it's going to have a butter sauce, maybe, we might put a bit in, but it's normally... With um, I mean, I like I like a good French beurre blanc. I've got yeah. to say, you know, the odd beurre blanc with a bit, of, you know. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, I like butter. Look at me, <laughs> <laughs> guys. Thank you so much for coming thank here, you, yeah, thank Angela. You very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much.